Today's video is about a chemical known as DDT and as much as I'd like to tell you what that actually stands for, I don't really know because it contains a surprising amount of numbers as well as letters. I'm pretty sure it goes like dichlorobenzene and then something, 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 something. But yeah, if you were to look at the structure of DDT, you notice that it contains quite a surprising amount of chlorine molecules bonded to certain places on the molecules and you'll notice that that actually means that it looks quite like BPA, but some of the hydrogens, some of the OH groups are simply just replaced with chlorines. And it sort of has the baseline structure that the benzene rings and the little chain connecting them pretty much exactly the same. Now, DDT was first synthesized in 1875 when some chemist mixed chlorobenzene, which is like a little part of the structure of the molecule, with something known as chloral and they combined and they created a couple of isomers the actual active compound of DT, ddt which works on in like pesticides and insects and stuff like that it only makes up like 25 percent of the eventual reaction mixture it creates quite a few isomers uh like things like dd ddd dde and then like maybe ddf as well or something like that I it was discovered as a useful pesticide in 1939 when another chemist or maybe biologist tested the substance on a fly to see if it could be used as a pesticide. If the fly died when it was like given some kind of dose of DDT in some kind of controlled environment, and if it died, it was a useful pesticide because the DDT was actually able to be uptaken into the, the cells cardiovascular systems and then uptaken into cells and there ddd could do its thing as a toxic compound and wreak havoc on the cells and the fly would eventually die and that worked and it was discovered as a pesticide and it became like a miracle the way that farming like worked would never be the same again with the the development of pesticides that would actually proceed after ddt had been discovered to be a useful pesticide because then the search for more and more and more continued but ddt like literally saved the the farming world essentially it was quite a miracle chemical at the time however it had its downsides unfortunately the thing with ddt is that it is quite an organic compound it doesn't contain many oxygens nitrogens or fluorines and these are the three elements that are able to hydrogen bond which create quite strong intermolecular forces and physical bonds this molecule of ddt contains absolutely none of these and so therefore cannot hydrogen bond and therefore it is more soluble in something such as octanol than water, where the water molecules are so tightly binded together by hydrogen bonds that a molecule of DDT isn't just going to be able to dissolve in there very easily whatsoever. But in octanol, which has a tiny little OH group and a chain of eight carbons, it's very easily going to be able to sort of mix with that. But it also, octanol has a slight ability to hydrogen bond, like a tiny bit, so it's quite a good organic solvent. Now, what's interesting is that DDT is way more soluble in octanol than it is in water, and because of this, a lot of biologically active compounds are fat soluble. Now, as much as something being water soluble will seem to you like quite a useful thing for the body, the problem is, is there are a lot of stuff in the body that is fat soluble. Loads of chemicals that you would not think are fat soluble are fat soluble, and DDT is actually one of them. This means that DDT can pass across plasma membranes, which are primarily made of fat very very easily hence why they are so easily uptaken into cells and human dna is not going to be very different from fly dna and so whatever it does to human or whatever it does to flies more rather it's going to be able to do to humans just at the same dose that you have to fly to a very very negligible extent on a human but the problem is is that's not how biology really works and if you look at it not just from a biological mechanism sort of perspective if you actually take a step back and you look at it from a global point of view, you start to realise how DDT might actually be a global problem for society. So what actually happened after that? Now, before DDT was actually discovered to be quite a bad chemical for you and the environment as well, there was actually quite a lot of propaganda about DDT, pro pro um, promoting people to sort of not be so scared of change, not be so scared of this scientific and technological development. There was, you know, like propaganda, like with wars and stuff to get people to join the army. Propaganda does have quite a big effect on how humans perceive the world because it's like if everyone's doing it It's like a whole mob thing one person starts doing it then two then three and everyone just kind of starts to follow that I, lit I saw this image on Google where it was like something saying DDT is like it's is good for me And there were loads of like fruits and animals and like a human and stuff and that's not scientifically true and we know that now but damage was still done from these kind of things being put inside of people's minds anchoring them completely to how these sort of 
chemicals actually worked inside of humans and worked inside of the environment, which is a pretty devastating thing to actually happen. And one of the first things that people start to notice was not the impact on humans, but the impact on the, the wildlife and the environment. And personally, I'm not like a massive climate extinction sort of advocator in a, in a weird way, but nature's kind of cool, right? Nature's quite a nice place to go. It's quite um, a relaxing, peaceful thing, and it will be good for your mental health. And I think it's beneficial for you to sort of use as a, as a human being on your journey throughout life. And DDT was a very, very harmful chemical because as much as when DDT is sprayed on fruits and sprayed on like cropland and stuff like that, as much as that's to get rid of pests, tiny little things, ants, flies, caterpillars, the problem is, is there's something known as bioaccumulation. How can you get from bald eagles and like falcons in the US nearly going extinct when this DDT is sprayed like 200 feet below where they normally reside? That is because the falcons, they'll eat like the tiny little m mice and they'll eat other tiny little birds who will eat other tiny little insects on the ground and stuff. DDT it's a forever chemical. It stays in your tissues for an incredibly long time because it's fat soluble and then and therefore cannot be sort of filtered out, drained out by water, which will then be excreted in the kidneys. Your body doesn't have the ability to do that. And so when you eat this this insect that's like dead of DDT or didn't quite take in enough dose of DDT to die, when a bird or a, a mice or like a worm or something eats that, and then it just continues to go up the food chain, all these things are eating that, and then it gets to like the, the really predator, tertiary sort of um, apex predators in the food chain. There's quite a lot of DDT inside of the tissues, and that's why bald eagles and falcons nearly went extinct in the US in like the 1960s, I think, because DDT was running riot inside of the, the wildlife ecosystem, which was an incredibly big issue. And that was before we even noticed the impacts on humans, whatsoever and then books started to be wrote about ddt primarily to do with this impact on wildlife since this impact on humans hadn't been discovered yet but by process of common logic you can realize that humans are top of the food chain as well as something like bald eagles and falcons and as much as humans are quite strong we're more conscious we're a lot probably more biologically developed and advanced than something such as a bald eagle and a falcon we're still top of the food chain and we're still going to be taking the brunt of this bioaccumulative poison inside of our bodies. Another problem could potentially be that DDT will like soak into the soil and this could affect things such as groundwater reserves, it could affect um, freshwater, seawater where aquatic animals reside. We eat aquatic animals and not only that, we also drink tap water. Now DDT is probably really unlikely to be inside of our tap water, especially now because it actually has been banned, but I'll get onto how it's banned and stuff like that later on in the video uh, but it, it might have been quite likely back in the 1960s and stuff i'm not quite sure but seeping into groundwater reserves below sort of crop fields and like into like little streams and stuff but that's going to get into sort of aquatic life we eat fishes there's a whole food chain for that birds eat fishes bald eagles etc they all will dive and swoop down to get like aquatic animals as well so there's going to be things like ddt inside of fish which it's not going to be quite enough to kill them, but then if we eat quite a lot of fish as a humans, especially in some diets, that's then going to have more of an impact on us. And then as we developed, as humans sort of got more progressively advanced, we started to realise that, oh god, this DDT thing isn't so good after all. It actually can be quite endocrine disrupting, it can actually, it actually could be a possible carcinogen now we've, now we've discovered it's all starting to kind of go wrong for DDT but it's such a miracle chemical in the, in the fact that it's such an effective pesticide that it's like it's such a big opportunity cost to revert back to the laborious mechanical farming that we were doing before or do we actually research more to DDT and understand is this the right thing to do to potentially ban it and then there were certain researches and studies that came out things such as DDD and DDE which are metabolites which are ways that DDT can actually be metabolized in the body but very slightly DDD and DDE are still toxic chemicals for you as a human being it was re it was detected in people's urine at, at a detectable level and that's a problem because DDT and DDD and DDE is still going to be inside your cells and it's quite hard to flush out the, the DDT and stuff from your urine but not impossible and so even though you've got that in the test sample there's still going to be a whole load in your actual cells inside of your body which 
is quite a big concern. What I personally find funny is that the majority of DDT intake inside of human beings is probably not even from the fruit that it's sprayed on, the crops that it's sprayed on, which I actually find quite interesting. It is from bioaccumulation in the food chain. Don't underestimate biology and stuff like that. This stuff really accumulates up, like a, mu a mouse on a daily basis might eat like 30 insects that all have uh, quite a big level of DDT, but it's not quite enough to kill the mouse yet. The mouse might get eaten by some like deer or something, or some kind of um, cattle animal or something, like it might be like fed to them or something. We eat deer, we eat beef and venison and, and all that sort of stuff, and that then gets into our food chain. Obviously, you're still going to have maybe like 40% of your, maybe 50% of your DDT intake from actually eating the fruit and the crops that it's sprayed on, but don't underestimate the other side of the equation where you've got the bioaccumulation up the food chain as well. But wholesome news, DDT is not around anymore. Well, I'll explain why that's not necessarily true in a bit. But it was eventually banned in 1972. 1972 it was banned. However, that's not the end of the story, unfortunately, because in 2018, DDT was still in soil. So you know how pesticides are, like might work practically. You're going to spray... You're going to have a guy in a hazmat suit because this stuff is quite poisonous, and he's going to like be spraying something like pressure washer looking onto all the the oak crops and etc etc onto all the onto all the plants and that's going to get into the soil as well as into the the target the pesticides and and stuff like that the crops itself so that when something tries to eat the crops it dies it, it will still get onto the soil of course and these chemicals were still found in the soil i don't know like 30 40 years later from when they were probably last sprayed which is a big concern in in my opinion that's how forever -y, these chemicals actually can be. DDT is quite a forever chemical. It stays forever. It doesn't biodegrade. It's like a plastic. It's a small molecule as in it's not a polymer, but it's like a plastic. DDT isn't used inside of polymers like BPA and stuff like that, but it acts like a plastic. It's not um, a chemical that can be digested by bacteria, which means it's able to biodegrade. It's not like got that electronegative atoms and the oxygens and stuff that these bacteria are going to be used to like they don't really know what the hell chlorine is all about like what the hell is this chlorine doing on the blooming molecule we're used to chemicals that have lots of oxygens on it lots of um carbon single bonds lots of hydrogens lots of nitrogens as well proteins all that sort of stuff we're not used to chlorine like what the hell is this doing here so it's gonna stay there like for a really long time i've probably never touched ddd in my life yet it's gonna be inside of my cells as i speak because Someone such as my parents would have consumed a lot of food that had DDT sprayed on it or had consumed a lot of food that had had DTD bioaccumulated into it. And that's going to be in their bloodstream, in their tissues that's going to be passed on to me because it's kind of has a similar structure to BPA and therefore it's also going to be able to pass through the placental membrane just as BPA is. And that's a big issue because this is like a generational chemical. It's one of those ones that if you fill the fish tank with it, and then the fish were like fine, they'd, they'd be having children and stuff. Eventually down the line, all those fish would be infertile because this DDT would be wrecking havoc in their bodies, even though the little fish who'd not really come into contact with DDT because then the water had been originally cleaned out into like actual normal water would still be infertile because this stuff would be wrecking havoc from being passed down from their parents and stuff like that. And that's what happened with like BPA and some other chemicals that were quite endocrine disrupting. And if DDT shows those similar properties, then that's really, really, really not good. If it shows similar properties to something like BPA, why are we making the same mistake with BPA by still having BPA in plastics? Why has there not been any progress on that kind of thing? Why are humans making the exact same mistake that we made in the 1960s and why we're we not rectifying it like we did by banning ddt in 1972 it's absolute madness to me that someone like me someone like people that i know and talk to on a daily basis would have never come into contact with this stuff rarely because i suppose it could still be bioaccumulating up the food chain now as we speak from times when it was sprayed in the 1960s and 1970s and stuff like that it could still be bioaccumulating you could still be eating fruit that has tiny tiny bits of ddt on it and stuff but it will still be in your tissues from generational sort of passing down and as much as it's not really something we can do anything about like i can't say avoid this avoid that this that this that i'll probably do other videos on modern pesticides in the future see if they really do have any impact 
on our hormones and on our body whatsoever. But DDT, as we know, clearly did have an impact and we need to learn from it. You've got BPA that has a pretty similar structure to BPA. All the other bisphenols that are used as plasticizers have incredibly similar structures, yet we're not learning and we're still continuing to use those chemicals in society. Like, why are we as humans not learning from our mistakes? That's something that we, we as humans have an advantage on. Our conscious behavior means that we are able to learn from our mistakes, yet we are continuously showing Earth that we're not able to do that and... God knows, maybe we're going to get taken over by robots because they're smarter than us. Or another species that ends up being smarter than us because that's how evolution decides how to do things. If humans fuck up too much by making the exact same mistakes as we did in the past, guess what? Evolution over time is going to mean that humans may not exist in 200 years, even if we don't already kill it by climate change and random stuff like that anyway, and the stuff that we're currently doing. But... Once we do do that, there'll probably be new species born out of the ashes that are actually able to competently be there themselves without becoming greedy little stupid idiots and doing everything that humans have done. But yeah, that's about all I have to say. With that, I recommend subscribing and for more content like this and have a nice day.